This is a LibriVox recording. Candide by Voltaire. Introduction by Philip Littell. Ever since 1759, when Voltaire wrote Candide in ridicule of the notion that this is the best of all possible worlds, this world has been a gayer place for readers. Voltaire wrote it in three days, and five or six generations have found that its laughter does not grow old. Candide has not aged. Yet how different the book would have looked if Voltaire had written it a hundred and fifty years later than 1759. It would have been, among other things, a book of sights and sounds. A modern writer would have tried to catch and fix in words some of those Atlantic changes which broke the Atlantic monotony of that voyage from Cadiz to Buenos Aires. When Martin and Candide were sailing the length of the Mediterranean, we should have had a contrast between naked, scarped Balearic cliffs and headlands of Calabria in their mists. We should have had quarter distances, far horizons, the altering silhouettes of an Ionian island. Colored birds would have filled Paraguay with their silver or acid cries. Dr. Pangloss, to prove the existence of design in the universe, says that noses were made to carry spectacles. And so we have spectacles. A modern satirist would not try to paint with Voltaire's quick brush the doctrine that he wanted to expose and he would choose a more complicated doctrine than Dr. Pangloss's optimism, would study it more closely, feel his destructive way about it with a more learned and caressing malice. His attack, stealthier, more flexible and more patient than Voltaire's, would call upon us, especially when his learning got a little out of control, to be more than patient. Now and then he would bore us. Candide never bored anybody except William Wordsworth. Voltaire's men and women point his case against optimism by starting high and falling low. A modern could not go about it after this fashion. He would not plunge his people into an unfamiliar misery. He would just keep them in the misery they were born to. But such an account of Voltaire's procedure is as misleading as the plaster cast of a dance. Look at his procedure again. Mademoiselle Cunegonde, the illustrious Westphalian, sprung from a family that could prove seventy-one quarterings, descends and descends until we find her earning her keep by washing dishes in the Propontis. The aged faithful attendant, victim of a hundred acts of rape by negro pirates, remembers that she is the daughter of a pope, and that in honor of her approaching marriage with a prince of Massa Carrara, all Italy wrote sonnets, of which not one was passable. We do not need to know French literature before Voltaire, in order to feel, although the lurking parody may escape us, that he is poking fun at us, and at himself. His laughter at his own methods grows more unmistakable at the last, when he caricatures them by casually assembling six fallen monarchs in an inn at Venice. A modern assailant of optimism would arm himself with social pity. There is no social pity in Candide. Voltaire, whose light touch on familiar institutions opens them and reveals their absurdity, likes to remind us that the slaughter and pillage and murder which Candide witnessed among the Bulgarians was perfectly regular, having been conducted according to the laws and usages of war. Had Voltaire lived today, he would have done to poverty what he did to war. Pitying the poor, he would have shown us poverty as a ridiculous anachronism, and both the ridicule and the pity would have expressed his indignation. Almost any modern essaying a philosophic tale would make it long. Candide is only a hamlet and a half long. It would hardly have been shorter if Voltaire had spent three months on it instead of those three days a conciseness to be matched in English by nobody except Pope, who can say a plagiarizing enemy steals much, spends little, and has nothing left. A conciseness which Pope toiled and sweated for came as easy as wit to Voltaire. He can afford to be witty, parenthetically, by the way, prodigally, without saving, because he knows there is more wit where that came from. One of Max Beerbohm's cartoons shows us the young twentieth century going at top speed. 
and watched by two of his predecessors. Underneath is this legend, the grave misgivings of the nineteenth century and the wicked amusement of the eighteenth in watching the progress, or whatever it is, of the twentieth. This eighteenth-century snuff-taking and maliciousness is like Voltaire, who nevertheless must know, if he happens to think of it, that not yet in the twentieth century, not for all its speed-mania, has any one come near to equaling the speed of a prose tale by Voltaire. Candide is a full book. It is filled with mockery, with inventiveness, with things as concrete as things to eat and coins. It has time for the neatest intellectual clickings. It is never hurried, and it moves with the most amazing rapidity. It has the rapidity of high spirits playing a game. The dry high spirits of this destroyer of optimism make most optimists look damp and depressed. Contemplation of the stupidity which deems happiness possible almost made Voltaire happy. His attack on optimism is one of the gayest books in the world. Gaiety has been scattered everywhere up and down its pages by Voltaire's lavish hand, by his thin fingers. Many propagandist satirical books have been written with Candide in mind, but not too many. Today especially, when new faiths are changing the structure of the world, faiths which are still plastic enough to be deformed by every disciple, each disciple for himself, and which have not yet received the final deformation known as universal acceptance. Today Candide is an inspiration to every narrative satirist who hates one of these new faiths, or hates every interpretation of it but his own. Either hatred will serve as a motive to satire. That is why the present is one of the right moments to republish Candide. I hope it will inspire younger men and women, the only ones who can be inspired, to have a try at Theodore or militarism, Jane or pacifism, and so-and-so, the pragmatist or the Freudian. And I hope, too, that they will, without trying, hold their pens with an eighteenth-century lightness, not inappropriate to a philosophic tale. In Voltaire's fingers, as Anatole France has said, the pen runs and laughs. End of the Introduction to Candide by Philip Littell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, in January 2007. This is a LibriVox recording. Candide by Voltaire. Chapter 1. How Candide was brought up in a magnificent castle, and how he was expelled thence. In a castle of Westphalia, belonging to the Baron Thunder Ten Trunk, lived a youth whom nature had endowed with the most gentle manners. His countenance was a true picture of his soul. He combined a true judgment with simplicity of spirit, which was the reason, I apprehend, of his being called Candide. The old servants of the family suspected him to have been the son of the baron's sister, by a good honest gentleman of the neighborhood, whom that young lady would never marry because he had been able to prove only seventy-one quarterings, the rest of his genealogical tree having been lost through the injuries of time. The baron was one of the most powerful lords in Westphalia, for his castle had not only a gate but windows. His great hall, even, was hung with tapestry. All the dogs of his farmyards formed a pack of hounds at need. His grooms were his huntsmen, and the curate of the village was his grand almoner. They called him my lord, and laughed at all his stories. The baron's lady weighed about three hundred and fifty pounds, and was therefore a person of great consideration and she did the honors of the house with a dignity that commanded still greater respect. Her daughter, Cunegonde, was seventeen years of age, fresh-colored, comely, plump, and desirable. The baron's son seemed to be in every respect worthy of his father. The preceptor Pangloss was the oracle of the family, 
and little candide heard his lessons with all the good faith of his age and character pangloss was professor of metaphysico theologico cosmolo nigology he proved admirably that there is no effect without a cause and that in this best of all possible worlds the baron's castle was the most magnificent of castles and his lady the best of all possible baronesses it is demonstrable said he that things cannot be otherwise than as they are for all being created for an end all is necessarily for the best end observe that the nose has been formed to bear spectacles thus we have spectacles legs are visibly designed for stockings and we have stockings stones were made to be hewn and to construct castles therefore my lord has a magnificent castle for the greatest baron in the province ought to be the best lodged pigs were made to be eaten therefore we eat pork all the year round consequently they who assert that all is well have said a foolish thing they should have said all is for the best candide listened attentively and believed innocently for he thought miss cunegonde extremely beautiful though he never had the courage to tell her so he concluded that after the happiness of being born of baron thunderton trunk the second degree of happiness was to be miss cunegonde the third that of seeing her every day and the fourth that of hearing master pangloss the greatest philosopher of the whole province and consequently of the whole world one day cunegonde while walking near the castle in a little wood which they called a park saw between the bushes dr pangloss giving a lesson in experimental natural philosophy to her mother's chambermaid a little brown wench very pretty and very docile as miss cunegonde had a great disposition for the sciences she breathlessly observed the repeated experiments of which she was a witness she clearly perceived the force of the doctor's reasons the effects and the causes she turned back greatly flurried quite pensive and filled with the desire to be learned dreaming that she might well be a sufficient reason for young candide and he for her she met candide on reaching the castle and blushed candide blushed also she wished him good morrow in a faltering tone and candide spoke to her without knowing what he said the next day after dinner as they went from table cunegonde and candide found themselves behind a screen cunegonde let fall her handkerchief candide picked it up she took him innocently by the hand the youth as innocently kissed the young lady's hand with particular vivacity sensibility and grace their lips met their eyes sparkled their knees trembled their hands strayed baron thunder tin trunk passed near the screen and beholding this cause and effect chased candide from the castle with great kicks on the backside cunegonde fainted away she was boxed on the ears by the baroness as soon as she came to herself and all was consternation in this most magnificent and most agreeable of all possible castles End chapter one this is a librivox recording candide by voltaire chapter two what became of candide among the bulgarians candide driven from terrestrial paradise walked a long while without knowing where weeping raising his eyes to heaven turning them often towards the most magnificent of castles which imprisoned the purest of noble young ladies he lay down to sleep without supper in the middle of a field between two furrows the snow fell in large flakes next day candide all benumbed dragged himself towards the neighbouring town which was called waldberghof trabdickdorf having no money dying of hunger and fatigue he stopped sorrowfully at the door of an inn two men dressed in blue observed him comrade said one here is a well-built young fellow and of proper height 
they went up to candide and very civilly invited him to dinner gentlemen replied candide with a most engaging modesty you do me great honour but i have not wherewithal to pay my share oh sir said one of the blues to him people of your appearance and of your merit never pay anything are you not five feet five inches high yes sir that is my height answered he making a low bow come sir seat yourself not only will we pay your reckoning but we will never suffer such a man as you to want money men are only born to assist one another you are right said candide this is what i was always taught by dr pangloss and i see plainly that all is for the best they begged of him to accept a few crowns he took them and wished to give them his note they refused they seated themselves at table love you not deeply oh yes answered he i deeply love miss cunegonde no said one of the gentlemen we ask you if you do not deeply love the king of the bulgarians not at all said he for i have never seen him what he is the best of kings and we must drink his health oh very willingly gentlemen and he drank that is enough they tell him now you are the help the support the defender the hero of the bulgarians your fortune is made and your glory is assured instantly they fettered him and carried him away to the regiment there he was made to wheel about to the right and to the left to draw his rammer to return his rammer to present to fire to march and they gave him thirty blows with a cudgel the next day he did his exercise a little less badly, and he received but twenty blows. The day following they gave him only ten, and he was regarded by his comrades as a prodigy. Candide, all stupefied, could not yet very well realize how he was a hero. He resolved one fine day in spring to go for a walk, marching straight before him believing that it was a privilege of the human as well as of the animal species to make use of their legs as they pleased he had advanced two leagues when he was overtaken by four others heroes of six feet who bound him and carried him to a dungeon he was asked which he would like the best to be whipped six and thirty times through all the regiment or to receive at once twelve balls of lead in his brain he vainly said that human will is free and that he chose neither the one nor the other he was forced to make a choice he determined in virtue of that gift of god called liberty to run the gauntlet six and thirty times he bore this twice the regiment was composed of two thousand men that composed for him four thousand strokes which laid bare all his muscles and nerves from the nape of his neck quite down to his rump as they were going to proceed to a third whipping candide able to bear no more begged as a favour that they would be so good as to shoot him he obtained this favour they bandaged his eyes and bade him kneel down the king of the bulgarians passed at this moment and ascertained the nature of the crime as he had great talent he understood from all that he learnt of candide that he was a young metaphysician extremely ignorant of the things of this world and he accorded him his pardon with a clemency which will bring him praise in all the journals and throughout all ages an able surgeon cured candide in three weeks by means of emollients taught by dioscorides he had already a little skin and was able to march when the king of the bulgarians gave battle to the king of the abares end chapter two this is a librivox recording candide by voltaire chapter three how candide made his escape from the bulgarians and what afterwards became of him there was never anything so gallant so spruce so brilliant and so well disposed as the two armies trumpets fifes hautboys drums and cannon made music such as hell itself had never heard 
the cannons first of all laid flat about six thousand men on each side the muskets swept away from this best of worlds nine or ten thousand ruffians who infested its surface the bayonet was also a sufficient reason for the death of several thousands the whole might amount to thirty thousand souls candide who trembled like a philosopher hid himself as well as he could during this heroic butchery at length while the two kings were causing te deum to be sung each in his own camp candide resolved to go and reason elsewhere on effects and causes he passed over heaps of dead and dying and first reached a neighboring village it was in cinders it was an abare village which the bulgarians had burnt according to the laws of war here old men covered with wounds beheld their wives hugging their children to their bloody breasts massacred before their faces there their daughters disemboweled and breathing their last after having satisfied the natural wants of bulgarian heroes while others half burnt in the flames begged to be dispatched the earth was strewn with brains arms and legs candide fled quickly to another village it belonged to the bulgarians and the abarian heroes had treated it in the same way candide walking always over palpitating limbs or across ruins arrived at last beyond the seat of war with a few provisions in his knapsack and miss cunegonde always in his heart his provisions failed him when he arrived in holland but having heard that everybody was rich in that country and that they were christians he did not doubt but he should meet with the same treatment from them as he had met with in the baron's castle before miss cunegonde's bright eyes were the cause of his expulsion thence he asked alms of several grave-looking people who all answered him that if he continued to follow this trade they would confine him to the house of correction where he should be taught to get a living the next he addressed was a man who had been haranguing a large assembly for a whole hour on the subject of charity but the orator looking askew said what are you doing here are you for the good cause there can be no effect without a cause modestly answered candide the whole is necessarily concatenated and arranged for the best it was necessary for me to have been banished from the presence of miss cunegonde to have afterwards run the gauntlet and now it is necessary i should beg my bread until i learn to earn it all this cannot be otherwise my friend said the orator to him do you believe the pope to be the antichrist i have not heard it answered candide but whether he be or whether he be not i want bread thou dost not deserve to eat said the other begone rogue begone wretch do not come near me again the orator's wife putting her head out of the window and spying a man that doubted whether the pope was the antichrist poured over him a full oh heavens to what excess does religious zeal carry the ladies a man who had never been christened a good anabaptist named james beheld the cruel and ignominious treatment shown to one of his brethren an unfeathered biped with a rational soul he took him home cleaned him gave him bread and beer presented him with two florins and even wished to teach him the manufacture of persian stuffs which they make in holland candide almost prostrating himself before him cried master pangloss has well said that all is for the best in this world for i am infinitely more touched by your extreme generosity than with the inhumanity of that gentleman in the black coat and his lady the next day as he took a walk he met a beggar all covered with scabs his eyes diseased the end of his nose eaten away his mouth distorted his teeth black choking in his throat tormented with a violent cough and spitting out a tooth at each effort end chapter three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by ted delorme 
in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during January 2007.